Uh, thank you for coming to our Comprehensive Planning Committee meeting here at Cleveland. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we know there's a lot of things going on this evening, so we may uh, not have as many as we hope, but uh, thank you very much for, for making the time to come here tonight. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Abby with our design team to get started. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. We have a few new guests back here who joined us tonight. Thank you. You guys are students here? Is that right? Yeah. What grade? What grade? Uh, 11. 11. Okay, <coughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, great. Well, we only have 19 slides tonight. So this is going to be a short presentation, and then we're going to spend most of our time moving around. So eat now, and then we'll start moving. Um, so we've begun most of our CPCs uh, with this statement that the students made. Does that sound weird? Okay, I hear myself twice. Okay. Um, and it's important for us that we're grounding our process and thinking about what has happened on the site, who is on the site, and to how we can make sure that the design intent um, respects the full history of the site and um, the uh, students who will be, be at the new school. Um, you know most of us here by now. We have a bunch of us from Malem and Studio Pitch Ready tonight. Um, as well as, of course, PPS. Um, and we will be sharing a few updates at the very end from our community partners afterwards. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we're gonna spend the first you know, half of this half hour of this meeting just giving you some recap and helping bring us up to our recommended direction for the uh, site designs. And then we're gonna spend, like I said, most of an hour doing activities and then have actually have a conversation around um, the activities and really try to come away today with um, a really better sense of your you know, full ideas about our direction forward. So in our last CPC back in late January, uh, we um, shared four comprehensive approaches. We then took those approaches to uh, the public for a community meeting and to um, the students and to the staff. So we've gotten a lot of feedback and we'll share um, what we're thinking of based on that feedback. Um, you really helped us understand some of the variables in your interest and we'll share what those other groups also thought about building on one site versus two sites and um, retaining the old building versus keeping the old building. So a reminder of our process, we are at CPC number five. So we have one more meeting after this and then we will be uh, presenting our uh, comprehensive plan to the board for their approval, and then we'll move into the design phase. So tonight, um, we will remain grounded in our shared vision. We do have the vision and goals printed on a big board in the back. Uh, we've actually added one goal that was not printed before, which is to make sure that we are um, respecting the um, fiduciary sense of the project and make sure we're in line with the um, PPS's goals of using tax dollars well and balancing how tax dollars are spent across um, different capital projects. Um, we are going to repeat those four approaches we shared before and show you which two we're gonna focus on tonight and then invite you to understand a little bit more about climate and about the sites and how site design may be impacting which approach makes the most sense. And then we'll do a small evaluation at the very end of that project. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. She's going to ground us in the four approaches and the feedback we get. All right. So I'm going to walk us through a recap of where we have been. I'll start with the approaches that we've been sharing with everyone. So across the top, we have the partial, and we are looking at partial existing on the left side. On the right side, all new construction. All new construction. Um, and then the rows on the top, we have consolidated on one property versus below distributed on two properties. So this is what we've been talking with you all about for certainly both the last, certainly the last CPC um, and prior to that as well. 
So we've also been asking these questions in the form of the spectrums, which I'm sure you all recognize. So on the top spectrum, we have retained the 1929 existing building all the way to the left, all the way to the right. We have filled all new. You can see across the top, the colors correspond to the groups and how they voted. So the CPC was far to the right with all new. The public landed somewhere in the middle, but a little bit further to all new. And then the staff was also very close to all new. We did meet with the students uh, last week and got their input as well. And that's the green dot, which you can see here is also toward all new. The second row down, we looked at building on two sites or building on one site. And what we're seeing here is that most of the groups were on the right side um, for building on one site. And interestingly, the students were over on the left. So interested in building on two sides. <laughs> <laughs> and then across the bottom, thinking about that trade-off that happens when we look at building on one site versus two sites, so how much open space is there? How much of that is used for plazas with plantings or how much of, of that is used for multi-purpose or turf use? And that's falling about right in the middle. So we'll continue to study that. Chris, yes. Do you have any context for the students about what they're, like, why they were on that side about building on sites? Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't <laughs> have a mic, but um, oh, they, yes. But a lot of it was around the out the open space and just more of it, okay. and then a little bit about the flexibility about what goes where. But yeah. the open space. Yeah. Uh, on the previous slides, how did you? Are the numbers like the counts? The numbers are the total number of people who participated in that voting process. So you'll see that between each category, there's a little variance, right? So we had some people who were excited about voting for you know keeping the existing building and maybe didn't vote. So 43 students voted on this top, and then we averaged it out based on where they fell on the line. And we included the outliers, which is why you may remember, like on some of them, it seemed like everyone was voting for an all-new building, but because we had a few who voted for keeping the existing that's what's going on. Yeah. I'm just curious um, how you connected with students, or like were there certain student groups, or family groups, or all grades? I'm just curious about it. Yeah, so. We actually came here and we talked to two student leadership groups, and we also had students coming in um, from out the hall that were participating in the spectrum. During the lunch hour. Yeah, yeah during the lunch hour. They weren't just students who were in the hallways during class. No, it was the regular leadership class plus the care leadership class for sixth period, and then we had part of the seventh period leadership class as well. So we did two different presentations plus the lunch. All right, so to get to some of the comments, um, <laughs> we can see here that they did like the blocking of PAL, so really understanding that busy street and liking that divide there. There was talk about the, that the green space should be used for campus lunch and outdoor time, so really thinking about what they don't have right now and really wanting that outdoor space, um, which again, I think landed them on that over to the side of two sites. And then they were very interested in additional space for affinity and leadership groups, um, also just bigger spaces for electives and CTE, so understanding that the building was going to be bigger and that they would gain more space. And then we can see here on the left, uh, the sky bridge is useless on one end of the spectrum. And you have no idea how badly I want a sky bridge. So <laughs> kind of spread uh, across there. On the parking, I thought that students across the street. Where how did the parking factor into what they were talking about? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question because as we know, the parking here now is for staff. So they did comment on parking and we aren't 
you know, if it's a perception of just needing more space in general, <coughs> is why that was mentioned, or not? I can maybe answer that. So if there are 50 fewer spaces and those teachers now have to park in the street, that's, that's the yeah. idea. I'm, I'm, I can almost guarantee you that's the concern, is that the last student here is going to be 50 spaces farther away in some sort of concentric circle. Right, idea. that's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, based on this information that we just saw, we did see that there wasn't necessarily great interest in using the existing building, but we did want to go ahead and review what that meant for us if we were to try to reuse the existing building. So some of the constraints that we're finding is that on the top, diagram here, and um, you can see the outline and the red is actually the existing building outline, and then the gray is the amount of building that we would actually be able to keep. So that is 22% of the existing building. If we were to utilize a scheme that kept the existing building, in the gray is what would be kept here. Um, we're also seeing on the bottom diagram here, the spaces in the light gray are actually the spaces that would be added on if we were to keep the existing building. And um, this is just tested, so it's not a design, but really wanting to get the program spaces shown. And what we're seeing here is that outdoor space that's left over for students that they were saying is so important is about 10% of the site. So that's the amount of outdoor space they would have. And again, that's based on the constraints of the existing building and knowing that the setbacks would have to remain where they are and that we would have to be building around them. In terms of program fit, there would be some compromises as we've talked about, just based on where the existing building is and the part that we would be able to utilize. And so there would be classroom proportions that might not be ideal for certain teaching um, recommendations or uh, distance to the teaching area. And then also daylighting challenges that we would have just based on that existing floor plate. We do know that the cost is approximately $10 million more than the base scheme. In order to use, um, exist, order to utilize the existing building, and we'll talk a little bit more about cost in a bit. And then there's always that risk of when you're using an existing building that you will come across unknown conditions. That certainly happened at Grant. There were fittings or uh, columns that we found that actually there were no footings when we dug down. So just a lot of risk that we would have in utilizing the existing structure. Um, what's the depth of the piece you're proposing to One glass. Oh, so it's like 20 feet. Yeah, so it's based on, so the existing building, if you go back a slide, <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so the existing building is three stories tall, one bay in, and then to add enough program, we have to go up to five stories. So we have to add a hallway and that other classroom. So that's what's making it so we don't keep as much of the existing building if we carve into it. So we kind of keep a ring and then build it. So that we're not building on top of existing structure. Yeah. Okay, so to take us back to our concept approaches, the four approaches that we have been looking at, um, what we are recommending is that we really focus on the right side of the screen, just based on the information that we have shared. So as we move forward today and look at some of the approaches that we are considering, we are looking at all new construction and then whether we like to take a look at what happens
happens when that's on the one site versus what happens when it is on two sites. So that's going to be the focus of our conversation as we move forward today. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, I just would like to make a comment, though, because as we know, no, you know, nothing is neutral. Knowledge is always not neutral. So whatever position any particular group takes, I think it's not particularly biased. And um, I'm thinking about the original comments that came up in, in the beginning about you know, the land that it's built on traditional uses, and I would say that one of the traditional uses that I keep putting little post-it notes on about is the fact that this was built in 1923 or 29. There's a particular history there. The structure of the building reflects that. And as a member of the community, as well as somebody who teaches here, and who has a daughter who's an alumnus, um, I feel very strongly that I like the, I like the message that is given in the original structure. And I understand that probably cost-wise, the all-new construction is a, a more viable model. But I just also wonder about that whole idea of, you know, what does it look like to the community? It's going to look radically different if it is an all-new construction. And I've seen the new buildings, and I've taught in Daniel, Lincoln, all of the other places that have new construction. And it simply doesn't have the feel of this building and, you know, and what it has represented historically. So I, you know, I know I'm saying this, and I know it's like a shot in the dark because it looks like a lot of people would prefer the all new construction. But I just felt like I had to say that because I know enough people in the community who feel this way too. And you know, it's also the case. I come from my own bias. I like history. You know, I'm an anthropologist who, you know, likes cultural things, and it represents to me a particular cultural moment, um, the building itself, and and, uh, and how it has, you know, stayed in the community. It's place in the community. So thank you for indulging me. I just felt like I needed to say that. It's a position that I hold. And you know, in the end, I'm going to be OK with what the, what the majority wants. But I just wanted to say we all do come from a biased position. There is no such thing as absolute neutrality, as I just taught in the theory of knowledge class. <laughs> And let, let me just quickly respond to that. We really do appreciate that perspective, and we are looking for that input as we are collecting, you know, as you know, both in the community meetings, at our CPC meetings, when we look to the public, we are taking in that information. Nothing is off the table, but where we're starting to feel like um, the mass is going is to new construction. So that's what our focus is today and we will continue to end up. Yes, yes. Um, there is a survey that PPS is sending out that will outline um, what we have been looking at in the CPC meeting. So really asking the public, so people that either can't be here um, or you know are not necessarily part of this process, to weigh in on everything that we've been looking at, and we've provided some background information so that hopefully they can be informed to address those questions. Yes. Um, and, and to your point, I, I 100% agree with what Absolutely, and we will have the opportunity to get that input from the community. Part of that questionnaire actually starts to dig into that a little bit more and ask questions. If you do prefer the existing building, what is it about it that you prefer? Is it the scale? Is it the detail? Is it the material? Um, just so that we can start to draw from that and really understand what it is. And if we do go to all new, that we can pull some of those elements in. The IA 
think the idea to this slide is to understand why we're focusing today on looking at the other two options. Like I mentioned, nothing is off the table. So existing buildings could still be part of that final complaint. I just wanted to add something as well. No matter what we do, if we're looking at all new construction or keeping part of the 1929 building, our project is subject to review by the State Historic Preservation Office. So no matter what we do, we are going through that process to review what we're doing to the historic part of the campus. So if it's an all new construction approach, the State Historic Preservation Office then will look to us to, they call it mitigation. How do you mitigate the removal of that sort of historic structure so that the new design, also salvaging materials, maybe taking parts of it down and rebuilding it in some other way. There are mitigation strategies that we would negotiate with the Historic Preservation Office and include in the design. So even if it's all new or keeping the existing, that process will happen during the design. Thank you. And maybe I could clarify further because the purpose of the slide was to, when we talk about keeping existing, maybe there were different ideas in people's mind. What is keeping existing? Is it everything? Is it 50%? You know, we were going to clarify with that. It's really this ring of outer classrooms in the facade. That was kind of the main purpose to make sure we understand when we say keep existing, we're talking about that ring of classrooms, not the whole structure or not the deck. That's what I realized. It's the first time I've seen 22%, you know, and I think not everybody at the meetings can read the diagrams. And so there was, in my opinion, a surprising abandonment of existing. But if you're going to be in this room, yeah, I don't want this room. You know, there's certain spaces you just don't want. And I don't know if it was, you know, brought up in a way that allowed people to understand what they were saying no to consistently. Yes. Just on the next slide, there was a box in the lower right-hand corner about cost. And I understand the first two bullet points. I don't, I'm not sure what acceleration means, and I don't know if you're going to talk about that later, but I was curious about that. We will touch on that, but it is, it does have to do with schedule and building on two sites and the fact that we would need to accelerate the work because we're working on two sites and not able to stage on a single site. Okay. Any other questions before we jump in? Yes. Was the determination mean that there needed to be parking that was created? Is that why there's that cost slide item there? Like that tax under parking? Oh, we did, we did hear that parking was important and there is actually an entire board that's focused on parking. But this does look at a way of trying to maintain additional parking spaces while still looking at spreading the program across two sites. Yes. How is number 4 risk this? Oh, great question. Number 4 is riskier mainly because of the sky bridge and the fact that we do not have approval at this point in time to add a sky bridge. So that would have to go through city commission and we would have to make sure that that's a possibility. Does the Benson have to park under parking? I just go by there this weekend and it looks like in the building that was put on the lot that the soccer field uses? That building has some parking. Okay. Multiple campuses. Okay. That's not part of the high school. It sits on the school. Got it. Okay. But yes, it does have, because it was, they completely covered the parking lot. Yeah. And I think they went, they maybe have rest spaces. Okay. All right. So it's stuck under parking, kind of like a sort of like a parking lot that is stuck under parking. Compromise between only street level parking, but we're going to get a little bit more parking in that building. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we were taking a look at is just how can we increase the parking knowing that we can't completely go down to do a parking structure. So getting that middle ground and looking at Tucker. Thank you. 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 Th
So some of those exterior components that we have. And then the blue are elements that are sort of special highlighted elements. So um, they could be a lot of different things, but the main thing is it could be library or commons. Um, for instance, here on this uh, block, we're thinking the 26 in Powell could have a feature space, like the library of commons, et cetera, that maybe is visible from Powell, you light up at night when things are happening, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the entry. You know, we can, part of the reason we're creating outdoor spaces in these schemes is to really look at, we'll talk about this more at the model that we have that you can all play with, is to try to suggest entry. We know that both 26th and Powell are pretty busy streets, and one of the challenges with the existing building is that there's not a lot of space between the front door and the sidewalk and then the street. And it's hard to absorb all of students kind of coming in and out at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. So what we're looking to do is create courtyards that could then tie to entries that are off of those main thoroughfares, either Franklin or 28th that could be opportunities to really welcome people in in a quieter environment and create that space that you might see when we went to Grant. And there's a big distance between the front door and the sidewalk to really allow that to naturally happen for kids to kind of space themselves out and have a little buffer to traffic. Great question. The question was, is there a height difference? No. Um, in both cases, the gray sort of bars, the more dense pieces, are about um, five stories tall. And these lower volumes are technically one or two stories, but they're very tall, one or two stories. So they'll be, you know, 50 feet, uh, just because of the nature of the gym and the theater space. Um, you can see that on um, the more linear scheme of consolidated, we start to suggest entry from 28th and 26, but again, sort of creating that outdoor space, that layer outdoor space that allows students to kind of transition into <coughs> campus, um, get the space we need to really uh, create a safe environment. Okay, so this slide shows distributed schemes. So when we go over 26, so in our focus today about showing you kind of the variation of things that are possible. This distributed scheme is one where that's sort of adjusted most because when we heard more, more interest in the distributed scheme, we felt like we had to test it a bit more than what we had. But once we're in new construction, we're in a better position to effectively utilize this block because we're not kind of going through the existing so what you'll see on these is, again, this is a view from 26th and Powell here. So uh, performing arts and athletics, uh, rest of the building program and sort of commons library. There we go. Um, and the idea is that we're showing some circulation spaces that could include the sky bridge as a part of the sort of larger life of the building and the campus that gets integrated. So it's not just this like standalone sky bridge element, but it's part of your journey through the building that extends throughout. And you can see we're using the sort of northern part of the current parking lot site with some surface parking uh, remaining. And we'll talk more about iterations on parking, but uh, the idea here is that by putting the density along the north side of both lots, we can have a more continuous experience across both lots, uh, and this diverge becomes more of a ingrained part of the circulation process within the entire building. Uh, it also gives us a really nice solar exposure because it has the lower buildings along the south edge. It's still tall enough to block out, you know, really significantly the noise from Powell and the business, but uh, low enough to lot of sun to come into that linear program. Um, and then the image on the right shows a slightly different approach where instead of having the performing arts and the athletics on Powell, we sort of shift, leave performing arts here on a prominent corner 
and shift athletics um, to actually its current location and uh, build up a little bit more density here with part of the building to allow an open space on the corner that sort of references Waverly and the connection to the fields as well as um, having a distinct open space here. So sort of two natures of open space rather than a linear connected open space. So again, um, you know, it can feel a little nuanced, but I'm not really asking you necessarily to vote on a lot of these or anything like that. It's more about here's the range of expression that is totally possible within the choice of going to a distributed scheme so that you can sort of start envisioning what that might feel like in a scale that is a little closer to a building than just a program square footage allocation. Mm -hmm. When you are showing this, when you are including that in there, so does the district own all the way to Burgerville? Uh, the, the district owns the boundaries of that parking lot okay. right there. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it will be a beautiful view of Burgerville. I was wondering about the 30 foot setback at Franklin, is that? Because we're residential, it says tall building adjacent to Southeast Franklin. Then is Yes, to all of that. Um, so it'll be 30 feet from property line. To yeah, the it's the, uh, without getting too deep into the code, a land use code, there is a, the setback, required setback changes depending on the height of the building. So when you put a taller building along the residential edge, you um, have to set it back further. Now, it's nice for the residential spaces. I mean, you get a lot of flooding landscaping in there it really mitigates the height of the building really substantially and we have some solar studies um, at the stations that you're going to go through to see that um, even when we put a, um, a five-story building right here um, the impact on the neighborhood is um, none to minimal in terms of shadow um, touching the residential lots most times of the year but look at them you know to, to see what, how you feel about it um, one of the things to note um, contrast to this scheme is when really anything that puts density on Powell is that we don't have to do that setback when we have a tall building on Powell for probably obvious reasons because Powell is different than a residential neighborhood so it actually gives us a little bit more open space when we put density on Powell because we can put what would have been that setback into the interior corner. And is the Skybridge driving the mass on Franklin if you want to get to the yeah. Yeah, it is. But um, 30 feet could be a nice entrance sequence too. It might totally end up could being be. a very yeah. nice Yeah, quality. it's also a great place for like floating and like a lot of other things that have to happen. So um, we, we're, everything we're showing you, we love. <laughs> right. um, these are all could be great spaces for students and for staff and for the community. And I think show respect for the neighborhood in different ways and with different priorities, you know? Uh, and that will be awesome for us all to be able to dig into kind of as we move forward in detailed design. But what we wanna do today is just make sure that before we ask you again to weigh in on your choice of consolidated one block or distributed over 26, that we've kind of given you a little bit more visual to understand kind of what's possible within those options. is an awesome opportunity to really adjust uh, 
the levels within it to either reveal more space below that might be buried on the street side, but visible, visible on the courtyard side. Um, so there's a lot of we can work with there. It's actually a really great feature that we have that because we can have a taller building that doesn't appear so tall. Um, okay. Oh, yeah.
the sun setting in the west in the summer, it's where it really bakes and it's really hot. Um, and the angle that the sun comes in in those situations where it's like sort of at the end of its arc is hard to control. So with conventional ways without really moving and being very fancy. <laughs> That's my mini seminar on day <laughs> um, Okay, the, uh, the other thing I'll just add to this before we um, move on to the activities, because I think there's some great information to share with each other, is that this option when we go across 26 is about 20 to $30 million above the baseline, which is this consolidated option. So where those costs are coming from are things like um, the sky bridge, uh, the potential for needing to mitigate loss of parking when we put footprint on the building by doing top under parking or some other approach, which is, um, you know, not very, not as cost effective as a surface lot. Um, and uh, a, a few other things related to, as Elisa was saying, from a construction perspective, it's just a little less efficient when you're building across a major street and don't have construction lay down area and stuff with the existing parking lot. So we're gonna launch into activities uh, to make sure we don't talk all the time. <laughs> um, and because we're really excited to hear your input and have you hear each other's thoughts at this point. So we have five stations for you. Each will be about 10 minutes and I'm gonna do a count off. One, two, three, four, five, so you know which station to go to. Um, but before I do that, I'll just outline what they are. So Renee is standing over there at, um, talking about campus cohesion, is talking about safety, um, how we define boundaries on campus.